The government of Nigeria and UN Women recently launched the Generation Equality Campaign in Nigeria. UN Women Representative to Nigeria and ECOWAS Comfort Lante introducing the campaign said the Generation Equality Campaign is rooted in a journey that began 25 years ago in Beijing, China, when 189 countries gathered to adopt what is considered the most ambitious blueprint for women's empowerment and gender equality to date. The Beijing Declaration is said is a platform for action with its 12 critical areas of concern. In our comments, and I quote, 25 years later, we have a chance to take stock of progress and also to chart a new path forward. It is in doing so that we launched the Generation Equality Campaign. Also speaking, Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, Amina Mohammed, said, Generation Equality is about older and younger generations learning from each other, but critically, it is for us, the older generation, to hand the baton over to the young people to carry on our mutual vision for a more prosperous and gender equal Nigeria. On the program, we will be looking at choose to challenge growing gender disparity and takeaways and prospects for action coming on the heels of the 2021 Women's Leadership Dialogue in Nigeria. If time allows, we'll attempt to address other matters. My guest is the UN Women Country Representative to Nigeria and ECOWAS, Comfort Lamte. The program continues just after this time out. Stay with us. It's good to have you once again on the program. Thank you so much for having me back. The last time we had the program, we looked at the global governance challenge posed by COVID-19. Thank God we are here once again. It's nice Indeed. seeing you still holding forth as the <laughs> country rep of UN Women to Nigeria and ECOWAS. But quickly, a couple of things happened lately and uh, a wonderful piece came from the UN Women and uh, it has to do with security of schools. Mm. Nigeria is a signatory to the uh, safe school declaration uh, activated by the UN. And one beautiful piece, it says, schools are and must remain places of safety and security where children can learn and grow in peace. Girls and young women must be able to go to school without fear of violence and unjust treatment. The girls and boys who are at risk must be protected, including protecting their rights to security, life, and education. UN Women stands with the parents and families of the abducted children and with the Nigerian people. What activity is this? So this uh, quote was actually the press uh, release from our executive director um, who uh, set this out in response to the kidnapping of girls. Uh, I believe it was 279 girls in Zamfara State about two weeks, two or three weeks back. And, and of course, you recall when the girls were also kidnapped in Chibok, I think UN Women was also very swift to respond. Um, the, the issue of the girl child and girl child education is, is really critical. It was one of the critical areas of concern from Beijing and has been since. And we have been making some progress in terms of getting more girls in school, certainly at the primary level. But we also know that uh, we need to do more. Uh, of course, two thirds of the out of, uh, ch children out of school in Nigeria happen to be girls. Over 10 million children out of school in Nigeria right now. We had a situation over the last year of COVID-19, which also threatened the education of both boys and girls, but particularly girls, where we had um, lots of reports of some parents um, who, because of the lockdowns and the closure of schools, um, were actually considering or actually actively took girls out of school for early marriage and so on. So there's been a lot of advocacy around that as well about the need to ensure that girls can go to school. So in an environment where you have the majority of people out of school being young girls, in an environment where you've had a pandemic that has exacerbated the risks for girls being out of school, and then you now have uh, this insecurity with the, the, the kidnapping of girls, 
starting from um, Chibok in, in, in uh, 2015 right up until today. So it, it, it was a, a need to raise an alarm about the need for us to make sure that we actually um, keep girls in school and make schools a safe place for girls. Um, of course, even in normal times, you know, girls face particular challenges in school, you know, girls uh, face uh, risks related to sexual harassment, sexual exploitation, etc. Sometimes the people who are there to protect them, teachers, are those who are harassing them. So there are all these factors, but as a parent, you send your child to school because you know that the school environment is a safe environment, you're going to work, or even if you're a home worker, you know that you've sent your child to a place where they're going to better themselves, they're going to be safe and protected. Are you aware that the NTA has a campaign, Stand Again Rip and Rapist? Start. That's great. That's great. So I, how does the UN Women plan to pull <coughs> to this? Well, you know, we have um, since 2019, um, not just UN Women, but UN Women and some of the other UN agencies been supporting um, a, uh, an initiative together with the European Union uh, Spotlight Initiative, which is the biggest global investment uh, to address issues of gender-based violence. And the Spotlight Initiative um, focuses not just on issues of rape, domestic violence, early marriage, harmful traditional practices, basically the, uh, the whole range of uh, different kinds of violence which women and girls face. And uh, it's been implemented in six states, but uh, much of the advocacy that it's impacting nationally in terms of the advocacy. So certainly, um, I think the, the more partners uh, that uh, we can bring on board and have a coalition, uh, the, I think the, the better it will be. And, and certainly we've seen in the last year with the, the lockdowns, of course, we saw how gender-based violence cases increased across the country, you know. Um, and, and so these sorts of campaigns are really important and we'll, we'll definitely look at how we can uh, join forces. Okay, that leads me to my concern today, which is uh, choose to challenge. <coughs> we heard so much of it during the Women's International Week and the conversation goes on. Now let's say it's International Women's Month, so we are month, still, we're like. still working <laughs> on, on, so on the issues. Now that we are still here, choose mm -hmm. to challenge. What I really choose to challenge all? gender inequalities. Okay. Absolutely. No, I mean, I think um, it's, it's a call to action. International Women's Day, of course, we mark it as International Women's Month now in Nigeria. But uh, it, it really is, a, it's, it's, it's both celebrating the small achievements of women, uh, big achievements as well, but it is also a period to, to reflect on and um, take action. Uh, it's a call to action. So yes, we do mark and we celebrate International Women's Day, but we also stand up uh, to uh, lend our voices to the need to address a lot of the persistent inequalities that are holding women back. So indeed, the, 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 the choose to challenge motto is about wh wh where are the barriers? What are the barriers that are holding uh, women back? And, and in a sense, holding um, our countries and the development agenda itself back and how do we challenge them whether they rate whether they range from violence against women all of these things have root causes but I do believe that a lot of them are rooted and, in and, and that's the concern now most mm. times we ask how do you cope now with the avalanche of issues on ground besides the 12 critical areas of concern uh, post Beijing 20, uh, 25 years on now Given the multiplicity of issues and interests by African countries, ECOWAS, you are UN country rep to Nigeria and ECOWAS, how are you networking to ensure that there is a synergy created so that at the end of the day we have a common front of women in Africa, a common front of women in West Africa? Well, we, I mean, of course, we support uh, one of the key uh, areas we support is actually having more women in leadership you know as you said there are a lot of issues but where at the decision making on issues that affect women you have a dearth of women it's a problem 
So one of the first things we need to do is also ensure that we have more women in leadership who can, who, you know, who are experienced in many of these uh, challenges uh, that are holding us back and who, who can also contribute to the decision making that will make uh, the space uh, a better one for all of us. And, and so this year, in fact, of course, uh, every year, uh, we have a global forum where we bring all women together uh, in New York, the Commission on the Status of Women. And, and the role of that convening over two weeks where governments come and say, what is it that we're doing? They, and, I mean, the process starts from the country levels, country dialogues to regional dialogues at the Africa Union level and then to the global convening in New York, where we each come, each region, so the Africa region, the CF on the Commission on Status has a position paper around the, the thematic topic of women's participation in public life. But that global forum is where we all come together and re-strategize and reflect and learn from each other mm -hmm. and set new uh, uh, targets and new priorities to, to address. So it's, it's a collective effort and we, we really take uh, uh, these global uh, for a very um, uh, seriously because those are the those are the spaces that women from across the different areas of life can come together and reflect on progress but also uh, look at setting a new new agenda and, and as I said this year uh, the theme is women's participation in public life which very much resonates for us in Nigeria I'm sure you'd agree because we are in a situation where in Africa, Nigeria, it has the lowest representation of women in elected life. So it's a crisis. I believe it's an, a crisis and, and, and many women are seeing it as a national crisis. And we need to be able to overturn this image of Nigeria because Nigeria is leading on so many other fronts. Why is it that in the, in the context of decision making, we have so few women in Nigeria such that we are even at the bottom of the scale? Could so it be because they are not frontal or they are just uh, laid back? Oh, no. <laughs> I mean, just, just I, believe, <laughs> I believe that uh, Nigerian women, and, and they are expressing leadership uh, across the, the continent and the world. You know, there are so many women uh, in Africa and in the world who, who, who see the expression of women's leadership. So it's not a question of being frontal. We've just had a Nigerian... Uh, 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 yeah, but violent. Uh, well, n it's not about... Uh, <laughs> viol I don't know where the violence comes in, but <laughs> no, it's about being able to recognize, I believe, okay. the, the resources that exist in this country, that, that, that in order for Nigeria to achieve its optimal development potential, it has to harness all the resources. Let me hold you there. When we return after the break, we'll take a look at what are those critical areas of concern, they, they, they are 12 in number. Have we gone even half of it in terms of achievements within the platform of women across the world? Stay with us. Okay, now before we went on break, we touched on what was the focus of the 2021 Women's Leadership Dialogue in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Now, we, like we said, the last time we were on this program, we tried to x ray the 12 critical areas of concern. Mm -hmm. We are still within the space of uh, post uh, Beijing Conference, 25 years after. Maybe this is the 26th year, right? Mm -hmm, yes. Now, uh, Inclusion of women in decision making. It could be one thing bringing women to leadership positions in the world, but are they involved in decision making? Okay, so um, now. It's quite dicey there, right? Well, are women involved in decision making? Y yes, they are, but they could be in, um, involved even better. I mean, look at the, the context again. We can use just the context in Nigeria. Of course, women are involved. If you start in, in the home front, women are involved in decision making in the, on the home front. You go into the public spaces, they are. I mean, there's one area um, where Nigeria is actually doing much better globally in terms of women's involvement in decision making than in the public space, and that's in the private sector. 
Because the global average of women on, on private sector company boards, it's about 17%. But Nigeria's average is higher than the global average. Nigeria has about 20% of women, so one in five. And so that's quite impressive, uh, although that's, there's still a way to go. And, and it raises the question, it's, it's not just because we don't have women who can play a, lead, a decision making role, they're there and they're in the private sector. It, it's evident. How do we ensure that in the public sector as well, in elected office, we, we, we see the same? And I think when I have talked to women in the private sector, they always speak about the political will and the commitment that was taken to ensure that at least a minimum 30% of women should be represented. They set a target and, and, and different companies work towards that. I think we need to ensure that um, we also uh, uh, implement the, the, the minimum 35% representation that exists in the Nigerian uh, gender policy. Uh, we have a constitutional review process uh, underway right now as we speak to amend the constitution. I think we, this is a golden opportunity to ensure, and this issue also came up repeatedly in the leadership dialogue uh, you were speaking about last week, that this is a golden opportunity for us to enshrine in the constitution this, uh, the affirmative action principles that will guarantee a minimum representation of women in political life. We know that countries around the world that have made progress in terms of women's representation, um, oftentimes it has been because they actually legislated it. So I believe that we do have to, 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 to legislate this in Nigeria. Um, the UN Secretary General um, last week when he issued um, a statement on International Women's Day cited that, you know, globally, women represent about 25% of parliament. And he says, you know, if we're going to go at this rate in order to re achieve equality, it will take us decades. But look at us in Nigeria. We are not at the 25%. We are at 4.4%. So how much, how many centuries <laughs> would it take us? <laughs> we need to have the legislation. And I think that's a, a, a global good practice that we have seen. And so those are some of the initiatives, at least that we are supporting, we're advocating for. And I believe the constitutional review process offers a great uh, opportunity to do that. Okay, just like, just like we will say, the success of an election at any level is the capacity and the willingness of the electorate to participate in the election. You could deploy all the materials, get all the umpires involved when the electorate refused to turn up. Would that be an election? That's the challenge. Now, that takes me to this. In talking about generational equality, you, you said 25 years later, I'm quoting you now, we have a chance to take stock of progress and also chart a new path forward. It is in doing so that we launch the generation equality campaign. And uh, if it is handing over the button, what is the UN women doing? Let's say Nigeria, ECOWAS, and maybe globally to conscientize the younger generation you are planning to hand over the button to, to uh, maybe the kind of value mindset reorientation mm. to walk them to understand what you're looking for. Because it's, it's one thing you want to hand over the button. Are they willing? Do they understand the button they want to get? Where will they take off from? Mm -hmm. And because this thing is all evolving, it has no destination. So how do you intend to handle this? It looks quite com complex. Well, um, start by saying that actually we have no <laughs> choice. We have a very youthful population, even if we... And, and um, you know, the, the, the globally, the generation equality campaign um, is... is, is charting a new path <laughs> it's um, here in Nigeria we launched it but even last year we also invested in a program of intergenerational mentorship where we actually brought women who had been to Beijing and you know from Nigeria there were dozens of women who went to Beijing so we to mark 25 years we brought 25 women who had gone to Beijing 
with 25 young women across different spaces. And, and we, we did a six month structured intergenerational mentorship for, for this group. And it was wonderful to see the, the transformation, if you like, of some of these young women because they were actually learning. And, and, and it's really important, even whilst we support the leadership role of young women, we also recognize the importance of intergenerational exchange. Of course, it goes both ways. So the, the older women generation were also learning from the, the younger women. But we, we believe that intergenerational uh, dialogue is key. And uh, at the end of that process, we said, you know what? We, we, we did this experiment, this pilot with you as 25 women. We need to grow this community to 25 million young women mm, who are committed and who are going to be champions of uh, this agenda going forward. So it's still a work in progress. I mean, globally, there's going to be a, 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 a forum in Mexico and then later on in Paris that UN Women is organizing, bringing uh, young people and women across the world. We have people from Nigeria who will be participating. But, but certainly for us going forward in everything, every area of our programming and activities, we're stressing the leadership role of young people and the importance of intergenerational mentorship. I often say to um, women who are established in their fields when I m meet with them, who are the young women who are with you, who are learning from you? It has to become part of our, our work cultural practice okay. to be able to ensure that younger women are given the space, uh, that they, they, they are heard, I mean, we had a conversation last week during the International Women's Day, and the young women said, we're talking, but we're not being heard. Uh, we have something to say. We're not an add-on. We're not an appendage to a conversation. We are part of the conversation. We need to be heard. And, and I think that's, that's important. And we've seen demonstration of leadership by young women in Nigeria, which has been phenomenal even just in the last year with different processes. So indeed, we'll continue to build on that and harness that in, in, in our programming and our advocacy and how, how we also showcase um, the good work that young women are doing, whether in technology, in the arts, in, in, in politics and so on. I, I think there's a great deal of leadership that's been expressed by young people. There's a, very, a global challenge, a West African challenge and indeed a Nigerian challenge, even within the UN women. Advocacies, timelines, deliverables. Are you worried? About the time. Because most times that's, that's the problem. We want to advocate, but we don't tinker towards the timelines. Mm. And at the end, we are caught up with. Well, I, I just mentioned to you a timeline that we have staring <laughs> us in the face, right? We have t the 2030 agenda. That's, that's a global agenda. That's, that's a race to the end. That's what I say. Are you worried? Abs absolutely. But I don't think it's impossible if we, if, if, if we can uh, put in place the things that need to be done, one of which is making sure we have women at the center of all of these efforts because when we harness the potential and the resources of women i believe we can reach those targets much uh, quicker and faster than if we don't so we need to develop where we have to develop and harness where we have to harness the capacities of women to meet our target uh, to, uh, of the 2030 agenda Comfort lamte it was nice having you on diplomatic ties again thank you so much for having me thank you that's it on the program. We looked at Choose to Challenge Generation Inequality. And my guest, as you know, is the UN Women Country Representative to Nigeria and ECOWAS, Comfort Lamte. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.